Perfect. Okay, guys, we are here to talk to Gregor McLeod, um, who is a Lewis beekeeper. Um, Gregor, I'll let you, you take it from there. Yeah, so I am um, Gregor. Um, I stay in Cullinish, uh, just next to the stones. And uh, just like yourselves, you know, it's very open here. Uh, so beekeeping is a challenge. Um, not as ideal as say staying in Stormway or something where you've got plenty shelter round about and everything. But uh, but yeah, it's a it's a great like the whole island is a perfect place for keeping bees. But it's just that every year is different. So some years you'll find that you have to feed your bees a lot, which is costly. Um, and over the winter sometimes there are losses, so you always have to be prepared for losing bees over the winter. Um, so there's a cost to that to, to replenish the bees as well. Um, so we are, I would say, on the bee line, just like the tree line in the Arctic Circle, definitely. You know, you couldn't, um, you know, you, it's a real struggle, you know, to keep bees here. But we have been very fortunate the last couple of years. We've had uh, good weather and relatively good winters as well. Um, so. Oh, no, is he frozen? It was oh, probably three, three years, sorry. So it was three years ago now, I was in the sitting room here and I saw honeybees inside my window and I didn't know that honeybees existed here. I'd, I hadn't really thought much about bee, like honeybees at all. And I thought, you know, like as that year went on, I was thinking it would be quite interesting to keep these. I uh, didn't give it much thought really after that. Then the following year came and I just happened to look at YouTube videos. And what you will find is once you get into beekeeping is that the YouTube is amazing. There's one guy that I was following um, from the Norfolk Beekeeping, um, the Norfolk Honey Company, sorry it is, uh, and he's got loads and loads of videos online about how to manage the bees and whatnot. So I started looking at all these videos, got really interested, and then found out that I could actually build my own swarm trap to catch the bees. Uh, so I, I put the question out on the Western Isles Beekeeping Association asking if this was wise, you know, would, would I get anything? And everybody said, this isn't the kind of place where you'd have, you know, just swarms, you know, flying about willy nilly. So um, I thought, well, I'm going to try it anyway. And I built a box um, just out of plywood uh, and put some frames, uh, some frames which are like this. I'll just show you just the usual, you, you know what a, a frame is like. So it's just a standard uh, frame with, with this has got, got foundation in it. So this stuff here is foundation with wire in it so that um, say if you were spinning honey or something that it doesn't burst on you. But so I put these things in it. I put some lemongrass oil on the entrance of the wee, the wee box and just left it. And this was April time that I had built the thing. Um, in the B space was about five mil so every sort of space there was in that box had to be five mil apart from an air gap down at the bottom uh, so it, it was quite accurate you know when it was when I had to build the box uh, and it was July middle of July a uh, really hot day and I went outside and sure enough there was a swarm of bees had actually made that their home and I was like it was all just fun and games up to that point quite an exciting wee project but then the bees came and I was like oh well, you know, what do I do now? You know, it's just a huge responsibility that I now had these honeybees. Uh, so I left them to it for a few days. Um, and then I opened up the box with help from Deborah, a neighbour of mine, two villages along who uh, eats bees. She's further than three miles away and bees tend to not go any further than three miles. So I knew that it wasn't her bees. Um, didn't know where they had come from and uh, she came up and she was showing me how to you know check the bees and stuff turns out there was no queen with these bees uh, it was quite late in the season which means that it's a cast you would have got a cast swarm where they so it's like a secondary swarm um, the bees the first bees swarm with the the queen and then secondary bees swarm as well if they're just prone to being those type of bees um, which Deborah actually does have, but but it wasn't hers. Um, so so we checked them. There was no queen, and all I had to do was to go online. There was a company called Becky's Bees uh, down in England, and I could order a queen. I mean, I didn't know that you could do that. Order a queen, and it was uh, delivered, or she was delivered via Royal Mail, uh, special delivery, um, which was amazing. So she went in to to the hive in a wee cage. 
um, where if, if you had to put the queen directly into the hive, the bees that are there would have seen that as a threat and they would have killed her instantly. So she has to be in a cage where they can get her scent, uh, her pheromones are making their way around the hive. And then eventually after about a week, you know, it, it can be a lot quicker than that actually. Um, they will accept that queen and then you can just open a wee tab at the bottom and the queen is released into the hive and she'll start laying about a week or so after that and then you're talking about uh, 21, 21 days before a worker bee um, will hatch out you know so quite a long time after that before you actually end up getting you know the numbers of bees building up um, so this is what I did and uh, it was September time there was a good number of bees in the hive I was still very much uh, new to to the whole beekeeping thing of course uh, and I had looked at lots of different methods of getting them ready for the winter and feeding which is extremely important up here if you know what they can what can happen is you get isolation starvation so although you might have a hive with the bees and full of stores full of honey you know for them to use sometimes they can actually the cluster of bees can be so small over the winter that they can't actually spread out to move to where the food is and what, what happens is they could be inches away or even one inch away from that food that's on the other side of a frame and they'll just die you know because they can't they can't reach it so this guy here of course didn't realize any of this at that time um i had a feeder on top of the hive um which they would have had to climb up into and then get access to the food that way so by you know as the winter went on um, they were starting to starve uh, and the little stores that they had you know it was just keeping them going um, and it came to actually the beginning of April you know it was it was a late start to the season this was 2019 it was 2019 no it wasn't it was the beginning of last year sorry 2020 uh, and they didn't actually make it so the cluster had got so small they had died and I only had one hive as well, which was also a bad idea. I should have, you know, invested in maybe buying another hive. Uh, when I, if they were getting weaker over the winter, you could join the two together. Um, and, you know, you'd at least have one hive to start with the following year and then you could split them. Uh, splitting means taking a frame of fruit from your hive or two frames of fruit with some food frames. Here, I've got a frame of honey on front of me as well. Um, so you could take that and put it into a separate box. You could buy a new queen online and introduce a new queen. So then you've got two hives, uh, one which is fine and can produce honey that year and hasn't really lost its strength at all. And then you've got your new nucleus colony, um, which is uh, usually six frames of bees compared to 10 to 12 frames in a full size hive. Uh, so so you'd, you'd be able to sort of like recover and you know make sure that you have enough bees to get through another year. Um, I didn't have that, lost them. So I had obviously got the bug. I needed to have bees um, and uh, I actually bought bees. Um, now we are not Varroa free. I don't know if you know about Varroa, but it is uh, quite a pest with the bees and uh, it weakens them a lot. It's a wee, a wee mite, it looks, looks horrible, it's really tiny. Um, and it can weaken the colony. It, it doesn't really kill them as such. You, you, you can treat them and keep the numbers quite low. Um, so this area here is not Varroa free because my neighbour, um, Debra Hirsch, had Varroa. Um, there are pockets on Lewis that are Varroa free, um, but there are pockets that aren't. So if you were to keep bees down in Harris, you, you definitely have to look at who's around you you know like I found this guy Roddy and Scalfi who's got bees doesn't have social media or anything um but it's really worthwhile asking around and finding out if there's people who have bees that are very roughly in your area um in which case you can't just go out and buy any bees from you know from round about Scotland you'd really have to go to get the Colin bees that Andrew Abraham has um has there his are the native honeybee, uh, Aphis malifera, malifera, the KMN queen, like uh, the bees. They're the, the black, they're quite black, the bees. Um, they're good for this climate, um, they're Varroa free, and it would mean that you're then starting off with, you know, very strong bees that'll make it through the winter and whatnot. Um, mine aren't, uh, I got mine from the Murray Beekeepers Association, um, outside in Renes there. Uh, but they're fine, you know, if, if you're sure that there's nobody around you with 
um, you know, with a bit of freebies, then that's fine to do that. But the the best thing would be um, to get Veroa freebies to start with and for everybody to agree that that's what you're planning on doing. Uh, Martin Johnston, who runs the Western Isles Beekeeping Association page here, he's got Veroa freebies and there are pockets North Tolsta Point and I think up in Ness there's Veroa freebies as well. Um, just wee pockets, but he did think, you know, really good if just everybody got rid of their bees and they all got funding together for everybody to start off with um, with the Veroa free ones. So if you were going to do it, it would be worthwhile just setting up your own uh, contact group to to organise that. Um, yeah, but but like I say, if if it's not a problem and you're far away from anybody who could possibly have bees, then I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about it too much um, because it is it is here, you know, um, uh, unfortunately. Um, but it's not too much of a problem. So, so yeah, but the, the bees have been good. I've now got three hives. I had two new, bought two new ones um, and then decided that just two wasn't enough. So I got a, I got a, third, a third hive. Um, all three hives did very well. This, is their, their, this was their first full year. Um, and I got my first honey crop from, uh, from one of them, uh, which has a certain type of queen in it, which I'm just trying to think. It's a, it's not a Carnolian queen or something. It's based, basically, you get different queens. If you look on websites where you buy queens, you can see, you know, their temperament, their uh, productivity, um, and different other aspects, disease resistance, things, things to look out for, you know, for what kind of uh, queen bee you want. Um, the good thing about the native bee is that they, they're quite, um, they don't eat too much of the, the storage over winter. So they're actually quite, I don't know what, what word I'm looking for here, but uh, they're not too heavy on their storage. So, so they're able to sort of like uh, manage their storage better. And they also lay late, their queen lays later into the autumn um, to help build up their bee numbers for the winter. Um, she starts laying earlier in the spring um, and also they fly in colder weather as well. So you could see them fly below 10 degrees, which is, you know, a, a normal day here between now and right through to April. So, um, so yeah, so they are, they are good. Um, but I, I do see my own bees, you know, none of them are the, um, the Collins bees, but, you know, they, you do find them out, if it's not windy, but cold, you'll find them going out, you know, going out for a poo or whatever it is that they're doing over the winter. They don't fly very far. They don't go for stores um, in the in the winter time. So it is just a decade really that they that they leave the hive. Um, so what's happening just now in the hive is the poor boys, the poor boys are being evicted from the hive. So the the male bees, the drones have big eyes. Uh, they're nearly twice the size of the standard worker bee and they are basically eating all the food and um, they're only there to mate with uh, new queens um, and that's why they've got the big eyes. They don't have a stinger so you can actually pick one up in your hand quite the thing. Um, so so they're being thrown out of the hive by the workers just now and they just get thrown out to die in the cold uh, and then the queen will lay new, new um, uh, drone bees next year ready for the swarm season. Um, so so yes, yeah, so I went out there and just saw a big pile of these guys sitting outside the sitting outside the hive. Um, yeah, but they are really amazing creatures. It, you get completely addicted to to it all. Um, the the bees. I'll show you um, how they arrive if you got them. So this here is a. A brood, not a brood box. Well, it is a brood box where, where the queen would lay the eggs, but it is a nucleus colony size box. And inside the box, you get six frames, six frames uh, which are sort of a bit deeper than that, you know, brood frames they're called. And that is where the queen would be, the queen would be laying. And this wee pocket down the edge here, that is where you'd fill it with sugar syrup. Um, and the bees basically just feed off that. So while your bees are in transit, you could say, there's always going to be food for them, even though there'll, there will also be some food on the frames. Uh, and all you have to do is basically just put your bees where they are to live. And when they've settled down, you just open up 
this wee slider and that will let uh, your bees out and they'll do an orientation flight first um, and then they'll just, you know, it happens very quickly. It only takes 10 minutes before they're away flying foraging or looking for uh, looking for forage. So, so yes, yeah, so it will be closed with the wee vented bit here when it's in transit and that screw would be tightened really tight um, and then it would, you would just you would just open it like that and then in the winter time when there's a chance that you've got mice that want to find a nest you don't want them to get into that perfectly sized hole for a mouse so you turn it around to this mouse excluder side here and that would be the way you'd have them over the winter so you'd have them in this box um if you got your new bees um say in june time which is the, the usual time weather depending of course when you'd get a new colony of bees delivered to you you get them in this and you'd keep them in here just until they settle down um you'd have to remember that all of these frames are drawn out so they're not just a uh, foundation that's in them they've actually got the full the full drawn out form of the wood here Here's a drawn out one. Uh, so the dog be drawn out like this, and the queen would be laying, and she lays up to two thousand eggs a day. Uh, so that's that's a lot of bees. Uh, so so you have to be you know you have to keep your eye on them, um, and then you'd have to transfer them to a full sized hive, which is around a foot and a half square, and that has ten frames in it. Um, so it's it's basically just a straight transfer, and then you put empty frames on either side, which means a colony can build out. Um, and then what you do is you'd then put another brood box on top of that if you needed to, and then she'd have a huge amount of space. Um, and the more space there is for the queen to lay, the more bees there are, the more honey that they will gather. So, um, so yeah, it's it's a uh, it's very important to uh, when you first get the bees to get them straight into into their proper proper home. Um, and this, the, the boxes that I have, which you can see here, it's just a standard sort of, uh, they call it a national hive, um, single skin. So you can get WBC hives, which have that sort of perfect, you know, um, slatted roof sort of look to it. Um, and that's probably the, the most ideal ones to have up here, um, just because of the driving rain that we get. Um, and you know, it just makes life a bit easier for them and your boxes. So it is standard national boxes that are inside the WBC outer skin. Um, but things will last a lot longer, especially in our climate. But I haven't done that. I just built a, an outer box myself that I'll sit on top. So so in here, this is actually a super where they store the honey. And uh, so that's how many sort of frames that would be in your hive. Uh, the other thing that you definitely will get if you once you buy your uh, main size hive is a queen excluder. This would go between the brood box, which is the lower part where you'd have the 10 frames with the queen laying her eggs. And this would stop the queen from then entering up into where the worker bees will store all the honey. So you don't want to end up collecting all of your honey only to find that your queen has been laying in half the cells and you can't actually harvest that honey anymore. Um, so this is really, really important. Uh, before that's put on, it is extremely important that you check the underneath of the lid in case the queen has been on that, because what will happen is you'll put your queen excluder on, then you'll put your brood box on top of that, and then you'll put your lid back on. And what would happen is then your queen's on the top box. So you've always got to be on guard to make sure that she is at the bottom, because uh, that could cause a lot, of, a lot of problems, and it would just be a a bit of a headache for you um, but two in the middle of summer it would be checking your bees every two weeks uh, making sure they have enough space making sure they have enough food because in june we have the june gap where uh, there's the spring flow of nectar um, but then things go a bit quiet i think you'd find in your own gardens up here that just very little happens in june before the next sort of uh, phase comes in uh, end of june july so they might need fed at that point. Uh, so, so that's important to note as well. Um, but so it's two week uh, or one to two weeks, you'd have to check your bees. It, I would do it weekly for a first year of beekeeping. And then you can start to relax a wee bit when you understand what they're doing. 
um, when they want to swarm, they're going to build queen cells, which are long cells that dangle off the side of your frames or are hidden down at the bottom or somewhere. So it takes a wee while to start noticing these. So you have to actually pick them out and destroy them. Um, but that doesn't get rid of the, the need that they have to swarm. So you have to actually do something about it. And that's when you would split a hive where you would take some frames from your main hive, put them into this brood box that I just showed you, uh, the, the problem with that, the nuke box that I just showed you. Uh, and then you've just started up your own next colony of bees, um, which might make it over the winter in the nuke box. But if they don't, then you can just join them onto your main hive and they'll be just one strong colony again. So you're less likely to have any losses. So all very confusing, um, a, lot, a lot of information. I'm going to actually stop talking uh, and take questions just because I probably missed a lot as well. Um, I was I was just wondering. Well, I've got a ton of questions, but um, what is it that you feed them? Is it the the sugar syrup, or is it, is it a specific? It's just sugar syrup. So it's a one one ratio of water and granulated sugar. Okay. You know, melted into a syrup uh, for the autumn feed, um, and then for the spring feed or for the June gap feed it would be a two to one so it would be um two uh two water one sugar if that, if that makes sense so yeah um yeah it would be a thinner syrup which would basically um seem to them like it was pure nectar and that they had to then dehydrate it themselves they need a lot of water in the summertime um to you know for the hive to survive so you'd find them going down into ditches and stuff and drinking a lot of water so they they do need that um so yeah, so that's what you feed them in the autumn and in the spring. And in the winter time, you'd feed them a hard white fondant block like you'd use to cover your cake above the marzipan. You know, it's got, you know, glucose and fructose and it's got absolutely all of those sugars in it. Um, and that's a hard feed. So because of the colder months, if you had put sugar syrup on, the sugar syrup could freeze and then they can't get access to it. But they'd also have to dehydrate it you know, like they'd store nectar and turn it into honey, uh, but they don't have the resources to do that or the warmth to be able to do that in the in the winter. So you feed them hard food, which they just eat as they need it. Um, yeah, so I'm seeing questions coming in there, but I just... Uh, I was just about to say, yeah. Uh, do, you, do you do any anything specific to protect them from the wind? Yes. Uh, so just, just over the winter, I don't bother in the summertime, um, I usually put a pallet fence around the hives uh, with a windbreaker, uh, kind of green stuff uh, around them. Um, my bees are somewhere that I'm not expecting to be, uh, I'm not expecting to them to be there full time, so I don't want to make a permanent, you know, structure ar around them, so I just build it in the in the autumn and then just take it down in the spring um, and then the, the the actual hives are strapped down as well so I've built a stand four fence posts that are hammered into the ground uh, then some wooden bars across where the hives will sit so all the water any water there's no lying water it'll just drip off the you know the wooden bars and then I can strap them down to that um, so so that that's all I do for insulation I usually put a bit of Kingspan insulation in on top of the bees. Um, so on top of the bees in the wintertime when you're feeding them the hard sugar syrup, the, the sugar fondant, it's quite chunky. So you can't just put the lid uh, straight back onto the thing. Because if you just see the, uh, it's very kind of like flat to the very, very top. So you, there's no space. So you have to actually put what's called an eek on top EKE -E, and that is basically it's an extension to the hive which is just you know, this it just makes it a wee bit higher up so that then you can put your fondant inside it and then you can put your insulation on top of that. Uh, if if anybody was using Kingspan insulation it has to go in at an angle so that um any water from the condensation from the heat of the bees drips to the edge of the the, the hive and drips down rather than dripping directly on top of the bees because that will kill them as well. Um, so that's something worth noting. 
um, our dog to the man in Scalpy, and he uses carpet for putting on top of his bees, but he uses the, the carpet with the hessian bottom in it. Um, not the sort of like the one with that rubbery stuff um, or the foamy stuff because it's not it's not breathable um, and it'll just gather damp. Uh, Kingspan's good because it's solid, uh, so it'll get damp, but then it, it'll also dry up, whereas a carpet wouldn't. So that's why he's using the Hessian stuff. Um, so yeah, but that's all that's that's all that's necessary. Um, apart from the outside of the hive, you, you know the WBC hive, which is quite expensive to buy, or you just build your own plywood sort of outer box that you stick on in the winter time. That's what I do, um, which is quite quite a simple quite a simple thing. Um, which isn't on the bees yet, actually, and I'm looking out the window just now, and it looks absolutely horrendous. <laughs> yeah. Jonathan, you want to ask your question? Yes. Um, well, it'll be more than just a question, I think. Um, I, we are moving to Harris eventually when I finish this conversion, and a number of years ago, I actually was on a site and I mentioned that I keep bees down south of the border. I got a torrent of not so much abuse, but um, don't you dare bring any bees from down there. Don't bring your hives. Don't do this. Don't do that. Basically, um, scrub yourself down before you come onto the island because our bees are free of diseases. Yeah. Um, I understand that. Um, I have got a friend down in the bays that have kept black bees. Um, he had some stolen a few years ago. Oh, I um, yeah. yeah, he's, he's, I don't know whether he's keeping them still, but I fully intended to keep black bees and not mm -hmm. the nandy pandy European bees that seem to not want to go out if it drops below 10 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also keep bees in a thing called a top bar hive. Um, where I don't have any frames or anything like that. They make their own um, combs that hang down a bit like an upside down toast rack. Um, I don't take any honey off them unless I've been to have a look at them and I've broken a comb. And, but I keep them just for fun, really. And I've done that for five years. I've never bought a queen. I've never bought any bees. Um, I've been and collected them when people have said, we've got a swarm, can you come and deal with them? Um, and that's how my beekeeping started. Um, I'm not set to be on the island yet, even though I'm here at the moment working. Um, but it was this black bee thing, and the, like I said, the, the upset that seemed to be caused, thinking I was bringing all alien bees in that would have lots of diseases. Um, so basically, that's where I'm at with it. Mm -hmm. um, I, See, don't I don't know. The only, the only thing that you'd really have to think about is, you know, the bees that you have down south, you know, it, it, the weather's different down there. You know, um, if you were to bring these same bees up here, they might not respond as well to the environment, I suppose. Um, but uh, the other thing is fowl brood and uh, these types of diseases um, that have been seen in Perth, in Scotland, you know, they've been picked up in a few areas in Scotland now. So it is that stuff is spreading around. And you know, as much as hard as you try, I'm sure I'm sure it would be near impossible to actually stop it from happening. Because you could say that your your bees were uh, free of all of these diseases, but yet, you know, it takes a wee while for it to be noticed. Um so you know, it could just so easily get onto the island. Um but as you know, you know, bees don't travel that far, you know, so any of these diseases wouldn't be possible to be passed on to any other people's bees if you're far enough away from people, you know, so it should never be a problem um, in the first place, you know, and I suppose nobody should be saying that you can't do it, um, but it's whether, whether it would work, I suppose, you know, and I, I'm not an experienced beekeeper at all, um, but it's it's just the environment, you know, the, the different environment that we have, I suppose, that you'd have to think about. Um, but very exciting with the top bar hive, because um, I've seen that and I, I just can't get my head around, you know, how you'd manage how you'd manage those bees. Uh, but very interesting. You, well, <laughs> you don't, or, or I don't, they manage themselves. <laughs> um, the only time I might manage them, if they swarm and they were in the village, and then I could collect them and give them to somebody else. Otherwise, 
they they do their own thing. Mm -hmm. um, and the colonies have gone on now for four years without any trouble. Um, yes. I would. I, I, do you actually keep native black bees, or have you got the? No, I don't have. They, I don't have native black bees. Black bees. I've actually got three different types of bees, um, and all three of them are are different. Um, so I've got a bee. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's quite a black bee. And then I've got uh, really, really orange ones. What are they? The, um, I can't remember. Anyway, they're <laughs> they're rough to deal with. You know, they're really, really um, bouncy off my suit. You know, and can be quite quite angry every time I go into the hive. But they produce really well. You know, they. You know, just because the bees are quite angry, um, I don't want to get rid of that queen. You know, that that's causing that because they're doing so well you know, in this environment. So um, if there were a problem with other people, say people coming to the house and they were just sort of like stinging everybody who came close to close to the house, then I, I'd obviously have to do something about it. But it's never been a problem. Um, they've only stung me. So uh, so I'm, I'm OK. Um, and then the other one. So I think um, now the guy told me it was that. Was it one Carnolian? It was. Um, Oh, I can't remember now, um, but anyway, they're very docile, um, and they're they produce really well. So, um, if it ever got to a point where bees, honey bees, could actually you know get the weather to actually go and mate up on this island, that would be amazing. Uh, and then I've got three different hives where you get you know a new strain of bees that would hopefully have uh, the ones that work really well, the ones that have a good temperament, you know. So. I'd then be able to have my own strain, you could say, of bees that works perfectly for this area. But I don't know. And it's all weather dependent. Um, and I don't know if anybody who has actually um, done a split without a, you know, without a laying queen uh, bought and put in and actually managed to uh, have a queen that went out and mated and came back and started laying. So that's so just... If, so you've not... There's not been any interbreeding then of, of the bees, I mean, not people. Um, there hasn't been any interbreeding of the, the bees because I think that's what people were worried about, that you bring a non-native bee here and it outbreeds the, the native black bee. Um, that was, yeah. I think that was the issue, really. Yeah, I, I don't think, no, I don't think, I don't think it's an issue. I don't think it ever will be an issue an issue here um i you know i'd love to try it next year but right. it's the it's the thought that well you don't know and if if over the years that i find that wow these bees are doing really amazing they're just perfect then i will keep trying to breed them that way um and um but it's it's all like every year's different um and there's not enough bees around really you know to 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 do the whole um going out and finding a mate kind of idea so um yeah it just it's just near near impossible here but if i did manage manage it and they turned out to be really good bees um i don't think they'd ever be as good as the the, the black bees but um at least i'd have my own bees if you know what i mean the ones that i know that i can deal with that have the temperament and everything that i want so it's a bit of a Thank can you get hold of the black bees then? Could you get hold of the native bees? Can you get a hold of them? Sorry. Yeah. Can you? Uh, can yeah? Can you get hold of the native bee? Uh, you can. Yes. I don't mean I don't mean by hand. I mean, can can you? Is there somebody that would supply the bees? Yes. So that's who I was saying. Andrew Abraham in Collinsey. I don't know if you've ever right. heard of. Him. Um, he's got the Collinsey black bees, and those are the well. I'm sure they're Scottish native bees, but that's what they call it, you know, and uh, that's perfectly suited for the climate, you know. And they're at West, they have very similar weather to us here, so, um, and that's who most people go to. It's just the problem that people have been having is, you know, getting access to these bees because it's, you know, order book has just been uh, so full, you know, so, um, so yeah, it's just, you know, it's, if you are willing to wait, you know, for, for the bees, that's the, the question. Um, and you could also, you know, so there's so many different factors involved in whether they survive or not. You know, it could be human error. Uh, it could be the weather was 
you know, so bad that not even the black bee was going to survive it. You know, it could even be something as bad as a cow or a sheep rubbing itself up against your hives and knocking it over and you've lost your bees. So many things, you know, so, and the, the cost of buying those bees in particular, you know, and you're thinking, well, do you know what? Uh, do the benefits outweigh the, the, the probable costs uh, that are involved, you know? So, um, so that's the way I was looking at it when I got my bees, you know? Um, it was kind of a case of, I want them right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also, um, I wasn't willing. Uh, yeah, well, I just wasn't willing to wait um, that long for 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 those bees. And there's nobody around about me who's got bees um, that I can, you know, harm. And um, so, so I, I'm not. I'm not worried. I'm not worried at all. Do you do you know if there's anybody in the egg that has any bees or keeps bees? Or... I don't know. No, no. Um, there's nobody that I've heard of. Uh, so three miles from Callanish would be just across the water to Bernera, um, and there's nobody in Bernera with bees, um, and it would be just close to Tulsahulish, um, not far from Tulsahulish, and out past Gernahain, out by the Black Water Forestry there. So plenty heather um, <laughs> round about here. So uh, this frame of honey that I took, so I got uh, seven kilos of honey from the bees. Just I just took honey from one hive this year. And I got seven kilos, um, and I just stole this frame because I took I put two uh, brood boxes, which are the, would be the deep ones. I put two of them on one of the hives um, because they were doing so well, um, and the the top uh, brood box is just full of honey uh, and uh, no uh, laying space for the queen. So I thought, oh, I'm just going to steal, I'm going to steal a frame of uh, a frame of honey from them, um, which is really good. Really good. So they've got plenty to do them the winter. Um, I'm putting the fondant block on top, um, and that's the security. So they might not go near it. Um, they might not go near their own stores. It just depends where they are, and it's just always good to have the fondant on there just in case they end up getting the isolation, starvation, and and whatnot. So, what what do you do with the honey? Is it, is it do you sell it or do you just keep it for yourself no. so this is my first year of having honey um and i uh, sort of uh, should have had a wee order but you know but it was all family <laughs> and friends who got who got a wee jar of honey i actually got the smallest jar that i could get <laughs> so that i could get it around as many people as possible um and so i gave them all away and then left nothing for myself so that's good i've got this frame of honey that i've been using which is which is good but um it you know it depends the, the, the Roddy who I was talking to in Scalpe, he said that last year he got uh, honey off them in the spring from the spring flow, but he also got honey off them in the autumn and um, he was absolutely delighted that year. So um, especially when you're thinking about, you know, that, that June gap, you know, it's like, should you take the honey off them? So, so yeah, so he seems to be doing quite well down in Scalpe. So um, he would certainly be somebody to talk to if he was willing, you know, about... Um, how best to deal with how best to deal with these? <laughs> yeah. Do you, um, so obviously there's there's a big hoo-ha about the conservation side here in the West Niles about the the, the local bee here. Mm -hmm. are, are you involved in that? Do you are you kind of um, are you involved in anything like that, or do you know if there's I'm any? I'm not. I'm not involved in it at all. Um, I don't know of anybody who actually is. Um, I'm not sure. There was a while ago when they did a thing where they were getting people to look out for the the bumblebee. The what's it called? The the one that's only seen here. It's called the great yellow or something or the something like that. Um, yeah, but there was was it yourself that asked me the question about whether they, that affected. Uh, the sort of the bumblebee uh, population on the island by having honeybees. I'm not sure if it was yourself or was it somebody that, else that asked the question. That sounds like a really smart question. So yeah, I'll take I'll take the credit <laughs> for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I I I did disagree anyway because of the the bumblebees just sort of like they're quite random in the way that they go and collect nectar and pollen and whatnot. Whereas the honeybees are they've got a plan, you know, so they go to a particular area. So they're not as sort of um, 
relaxed as the bumblebees. So I don't see them as sort of like taken away from their environment and um, their resources at all. Um, but I, it, you know, if it wasn't yourself, that's the question. I thought it was a very, very good question to ask, but I don't, I don't see it because this garden's absolutely full of bumblebees and it's nice to see both of them actually. Um, I've got walls full of nasturtiums and right now when they have a nice day, that's sort of like the last thing that they're at, you know, of the year. Um, so yeah, they, they seem to work together well. The problem I've noticed with the bumblebees is that they're getting a lot more of the wee uh, spider mites on them. Um, and the, you just find them all walking across the road and things and they're not able to fly. Um, so me being a, a beekeeper and wanting to look after everything, I took a one singular bee into the house and picked off all of these, uh, or tried to pick off all of the mites. I was spraying a mixture of sugar syrup and um, uh, tea tea oil and different things and then so the bee was cleaning itself. And I had that bee for a fortnight in the house and it was crawling around the floor and the dogs were sort of like putting their nose up to it and it was working its way up the curtain and it would get to the top and it would fly off the curtain and it would just sort of fly and hit the ground, you know, and it would keep doing this and cleaning itself up. And anyway, fortnight later, I was sitting, you know, having a cup of tea and there it was flying around the kitchen. I was like, yes, I just saved <laughs> one bumblebee. <laughs> and I opened the door and I let this bumblebee go and Barney the dog was outside and it was so lucky but he just went <laughs> like that <laughs> jumped up to go and grab it in his mouth and thankfully the thing got away but uh, yeah it's amazing what you'll do it's honestly it's, it's, like, it's like a bug you could say it really is an addiction definitely an addiction yeah is it is it quite an expensive hobby it is it is but there are you know i'll always justify it in some ways <laughs> there's always a more expensive hobby out there you know? <laughs> Um, yeah, you, when you've got um, you've you've got to buy all of the the kit, the clothes, um, the hives and parts. You know, can be around five hundred pounds. Wow. Um, you know, so it is it is an expensive expensive hobby. You know, so. So um, what 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 made you decide to go down the the, the, the route of having bees? So it was just the, the like seeing these honeybees coming into the house um, and realizing that there's honeybees here and I didn't know that and then reading up on them, um, then finding out coming up I think I actually just came across a video of a guy building a swarm trap to catch honeybees and I was like oh I had bees here last year I'm going to try and do this and I and I did it and I I did catch a swarm of bees which everybody said was impossible but. Um, yeah, but it was actually, it was a guy who, the, so the, the, the reason I actually got a swarm of bees when there's nobody around here with bees, it was a guy called, um, oh jeez, I've forgotten his name, that always happens when I say The guy in Stornoway anyway, you're in the hospital, um, and he's got a croft in Briasvich, just not even a mile away from here, and he ends up getting swarms all the time from his bees, just really bad for swarming, and the ones that swarm, he just puts them in a box and he sends them over to the Croft and Bias and just leaves them to it. And he'll go and check them at the end of the year and see if, you know, if they're worth saving or if anything's happened to them. Um, so that's how I got my swarm of bees. And that's why I got them without a queen because it was a, it was a cast swarm, um, oh. like a relatively late, late in the season sort of swarm. But um, yeah, so he, came, he approached me one day and said, it's like, oh, you got, you got my, my bees that you got. And I was like, they're my bees. <laughs> Don't you dare, you know, I have felt something like they're, 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 they're suddenly they were in my ownership. You know? um, yeah, so I was like, it's like, this is a really awkward conversation. I was like, no, 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 these are my bees. And uh, he said, it's like, how are they doing anyway? Are they getting on really well? And I was like, yeah, 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 they've been absolutely fine. I've actually got two hives now. I didn't have the heart to tell him that his bees had died, you know, <laughs> <laughs> over the winter. So, um, but yeah, but it, it is the, it was the, the learning curve. And I, honestly, every second of the day, I'm just, I'm on YouTube or I'm planning, you know, what's the next stage yeah. in the year of beekeeping? What, you know, things do I have to do? Um, I, have, I was using a thing called um, Apistan strips, which are, uh, it's got thyme all in a mixture of sort of, chemicals that are thankfully that one is fine if you've got honey supers on it doesn't affect honey so it wouldn't actually affect us if we got in contact with the, the chemicals in it 
but you're supposed to put the, these wee strips in between your frames to try and peel off the varroa um, while it's still quite warm. And I didn't get a chance to do that this year. And it was only on Saturday that I put these strips in. And I thought, well, do you know what? I'm going to try it anyway and see what happens. Um, so if this doesn't work, then I'll just have to find somebody who's got an alternative uh, method of treating the bees over the winter. I don't know who you'll have. Um, what's it called, uh, Jonathan? Um, the, the sort of like, what's that? Did you did you ask me a question then? Because it's breaking did, up there. Oh, sorry. Yes, I did. The the sort of the steam kind of smoky stuff that they use for uh, treating the bees for the row in the winter. Can you know what it's called? I've never I've never fed my bees. I've never smoked. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a varroa. It's a I don't varroa. think my bees. My bees have never had varroa, and that's the, I understand the reason for that is the commercially made frames are of a, are of a certain size, the cells, and the mm -hmm. varroas tend to go for the bigger cells that's or right. the smaller cells. I don't know, but the thing is, if you keep them naturally and they make their own combs, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. near enough find their own level, if you know what I mean. That's um, right. Yeah. And they do what they do as bees, um, and which is the thing that I've always been interested in. But I found a guy called, I didn't find him, I found about him called um, Philip Chandler, and he's called the Barefoot Beekeeper. Now, he might be a bit of Jesus sandals and brown rice kind of person, um, but he's definitely the person that I got into and kept them in on the, like I said, these top bar hives, yeah. which I saw on Gardener's World once. And I thought mm -hmm. I could make a top bar hive. Yeah, yeah. I like making things. So I made it and then I thought, oh, I better get some bees now. That's how mine came about from building a hive and then yeah. thinking I better populate it. Um, but it, it's, it's worth, I mean, I don't want to push this top bar hive thing, but if you wanted a bit of a challenge, maybe right. you could look this bear the barefoot beekeeper up and and yeah oh, and just, definitely. Oh, yeah, you know I'd, 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 look, straight, I'd be straight onto youtube looking for this guy <laughs> well it, it's worth, everyone, like. <laughs> and the, you know there's, there's there's examples of people having um colonies mostly in america in different things you know hollowed out logs etc mm -hmm. um things that bees would go and find naturally really um so yeah, I mean, I I won't. I don't think I'll keep them in those uh, what they call wear hives or something. Uh, the warm. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, to, to be honest, it looks like it's too much trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm probably a yeah. lazy beekeeper. You know, <laughs> they do what they do. I watch them come and go. Yeah. I see what they're doing. I see the drones come out. Yeah. They sting the grand granddaughter now and then. And we're all quite happy with them doing what they do. Yeah. And and I don't lift a finger, yeah. really. That's not so, yeah. That's great. That's, <laughs> that's, um, the, maybe that makes enjoyment. Fun. Like I uh, I was very lucky that they had so much honey this year, but even if there was no honey ever from those bees, I would be quite happy because they're just so interesting, so amazing. I could sit and watch their comings and goings all day long, no bother at all. It's, yeah, uh, I, it's I watch really them coming in, in and out of the hive, different coloured pollen on the legs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes there's loads coming in and out. Then you see the bigger ones coming out. You think, oh, here's the drones. And then there's a sound changes in the hive uh -huh. at a certain time of year. And you think they're going to swarm. Well, they actually swarmed while, while I was up in Harris working on this. The wife rings up. She said, they're swarming, they're swarming. I said, well, there's nothing you can do. Let them go. You know? And that thing about your friend saying there is bees. I, if I were a bee, I'd object to that because I'd think, well, I'm a free spirit. I don't want to, I, that makes me sound like a, yeah. an aging hippie, that, but, um, but yeah, I don't think you can own the bees, <laughs> no. you know. What I mean. Unless the queen, unless it's swarmed with a queen and the queen has a, a mark on her, then they could say, oh, that's definitely my queen. And then you couldn't really sort of like argue it, you know. But I, I've never marked the queen. I've never even looked for her. I have, once they swarmed in our village and somebody came to me and said, 
your bees are, are in, the, in, the, in the lane. And I said, have they got little jackets on? No. I said, well, they're not mine then. <laughs> That's, people think that they can recognise people's bees. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know, but yeah. There you go. Yeah. But they are fascinating creatures, and they are yeah. worth keeping. It's interesting, what you were saying about, it's interesting what you were saying about the, the drone cells and how that's where the, the vast majority of uh, Varroa, um, the Varroa actually are. And one of my hives um, is actually quite a deep, um, so look at the screen. So usually you've got the frame and then there's a sort of bee space down below. But I got one and the bee space is too much. So there's too much vanadia below and they've actually built comb underneath the frame so underneath the bottom yeah. line of the frame and that's where all of the uh, drone cells are going so when it comes to i didn't actually get a chance to do it but i could have actually gone in there and just sliced off all of that and just got rid of it and that would have been me pretty much solving the varroa problem uh, right there and then but of course me being me uh well too, too many other things going on i didn't actually get didn't get to do that, but I'm sure they'll be fine. Even just the fact that they're down below and away from the rest of the bees um, is probably going to make a huge difference. So, yeah, but it is, it's a good point. So my, my, my colleague's got a question for you both. Um, she's wanting to know, um, what do, what are the bees doing in the what, oh, winter? Are they hibernating? Are they still doing what bees do or, or what? Put it, Jonathan. The, Either or, I don't mind. Well, you talk to me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, bees don't hibernate, as far as I understand. They're not like hedgehogs. And down south, when it was a fairly warm winter, I think that's more worrying because they come out with it being a warm day. They use energy, and then there's no food for them outside. And like you mentioned earlier, the food could be one or two frames along, and the bees don't move. You know, the, the, the colonies can starve to death when there's row upon row of stores, but they won't move. So I think, you know, if it was a, a warm winter, that's, I don't like to see them out in winter, really, because I'm thinking, well, you've got nowhere to go, nothing to, nothing to get hold of. Um, usually the ivy's out at our place, but that's about it. Um, so they don't hibernate. They just, I think they stay at, what, about 30 degrees or something. I know it's quite right. warm in there. The queen, um, the queen has to stay uh, at around 30 degrees in the centre of the cluster. Yeah. So the bees sort of like go in a circle, so the outside bees move into the centre and they're just constantly, you know, staying in that wee cluster. But the most amazing thing you can do in the winter time just to check on your bees is put your ear up to the side of the hive and it just sounds like a smooth running machine. It's the most amazing sound, this hum inside that hive of them vibrating, you know, their bodies and keeping, keeping the queen at that perfect temperature. Um, and she does, she does still lay right through the winter, but a very, very tiny, tiny wee circle um, right in where she is in the middle of the cluster. Uh, and that just basically keeps the bees numbers ticking over until they get to spring. So she doesn't stop completely, um, which, is, which is good. <laughs> um, just- I think it's a great thing to learn. I, mean, I didn't realise that all the all the bees that did the work are all female, which, you know, if you're female, you would say, yeah, that's typical of life. Um, but it's all, it's all females that work and the drones being the males do nothing. I view the drones as 1830 holidays that go off to Ibiza and um, have a bit of fun. And, and mind you, when they've had a bit of fun, these bees, they die which is mm-hmm. kind of like the 1830s. They could have a bit of fun, come back, and they find out they've got something they shouldn't have. Um, yeah. But I just treat, I just think they're like holiday makers, those. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's it. And the queen gets what she wants and starts mm-hmm. another colony. I, yeah. You know, I can actually link them to humans and think, oh, that's a bit like this one, that's a bit like another one. But to, it's the fact that the, 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 the queen can actually decide what what eggs she's going to lay, whether it's going to be a drone or not. And the fact yeah. that when they, they hatch out the workers, they have to go through a kind of hierarchy of cleaning their own cells, being a cleaner, being a builder, before they're even allowed out 
to, Don't forget to follow. the Undertaker. <laughs> oh well, well the Undertaker's are, yeah, I've seen them carrying bees out. It's it's amazing. Yeah. I've seen them carry wasps out before as well. I wouldn't want to be a wasp that gets into sixty thousand bees. Um, but they can be a bit of a pest. Uh, but yeah, it's the fascination. That's that's really what it is, just a fascination. Yeah. The perfect they, democracy. <laughs> um <laughs> well, well, yeah, I've, I've thought about that because everybody thinks it's ruled by the Queen, uh, but it's, it's not. not. No. It's a collective no. thing that, you know, once the Queen's f fulfilled what she needs to do, they get rid of her one way or another. Um, and people, people seem to, that I talk to, see them as individual bees, and it's not you've got to see it as just a colony, that it's one unit. It's super organism. And, when it's when it splits, that's it's giving birth, if you like. Um, it's getting a bit philosophical. This, so I think that's I'll shut up. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is. That's just the, the the way it works, and it's just amazing. You know how they just yeah. know when it's time to move on. Yeah. You know, and then like the queen pheromone starts to die out, and so then the workers know to stop feeding the queens that she's lighting up, so that she can fly, and then all of the. It's almost like they're saving the original hive by leaving it. You know, it's almost like they're saying, it's like, uh, I'm, I'm really old and too much of a burden on everybody. I'm going to put myself into a cave home. You know, that sort of idea. You know, it's sort of like, just sort of like, let them get on with their lives and let it sort of like keep on going, you know. So it's, it's quite amazing. So if, if the queen leaves, do you have to get another queen to replace that one or will she come back or...? How does that work? If the queen leaves, yeah, like like see how you're saying that they, they basically so when when the queen stops releasing her pheromones, they'll stop feeding her so that she can fly. I presume that she'll fly away. So then, how does the colony reproduce after that? Like, do you have to get another queen, or will she come back in so the next the season? Or works. The way it works in the wild, um, like without any human intervention whatsoever, um, the bees that are left in the hive realise that um, the queen has gone. All the flying bees have left with that queen um, and all that's left are the young worker bees. Um, now, the queen will have laid some eggs in, say, the last day or two. Um, if they realise that the queen's disappeared, they'll build a, like an emergency queen cell um, which is they will feed uh, that wee egg royal jelly, I think, for four days or something. More royal jelly than any any of the others would get. Um, and then they'll produce their own queen. But then that queen has to then fly off and um, mate and then come back and then lay. So that colony is really on the verge of like loss, you know, when they're relying on that one queen. Because what else happens is, Sometimes they don't just build one uh, queen cell, they'll actually build a number of queen cells. But when the queen hatches, um, or even before they hatch, they actually make a noise, which is the most strange noise. That it's like a, it's like the corn cake actually. It's a corn cake sort of noise. And what she's doing is she's they're listen, they're doing that noise, and they'll listen for any other noises like that. And once they hear that there's another noise, they know that there's more than one of them. Uh, about to hatch out or even after they hatch out they're still doing the noise they'll go around and they will actually sting that other queen or the, these other queens to death um so that they're the one queen that then goes out and mates and comes back but then there's no guarantee that it makes it you know when a starling flies past and takes it you know so so yeah it really is on its knees you know when when it comes to that uh, comes to that point but um, they, they're doing it for the best of the, 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 the for the best for the colony, but it could go either way, really. Um, but yeah, so the queen bee is the only bee that can sting multiple times. The male bee doesn't sting at all, so you can just lift it up in your hand, and it'll um, yeah, it won't sting you. And the worker bees will die ninety percent of the time when they've stung you because they've got a barbed stinger. So the barb gets stuck in you, and then their insides you know, get pulled out when they fly away um, and they just die. Some bees will actually run around and if you, if you, if you can just stand there and watch a bee sting you, you know, it'll actually run around in circles and actually loosen itself and, you know, leave. Um, but because um, we're all dressed up in like fibrous clothing, uh, we've got like 
uh, leather gloves. When that barb goes in, it really doesn't come back out. So you, the, the bee does does die. You know, it'll fly off, but it will it will it will die, um, which is a shame. So it's always nice to try and be as gentle as possible when you're dealing with the bees. Uh, to just do everything that you can to stop them from wanting to sting you. But obviously, like I was saying about one of my hives, they're pretty angry because I I was out this one day in late spring. Uh, doing a doing an inspection and um, they were bouncing all over me. That was fine. Um, and I was showing a guy down the road, you know, taking him to see the bees. And it actually managed. I was wait. I was wearing just a t-shirt, so just above where my glove ended, sort of here. It stung me just sort of close to my elbow, and I was thinking, feeling this sort of like sweet bit of a, you know, a bit of a pain. So it's just I had never been stung by anything in my life. So even the thought of getting stung by a bee, you know. It terrified me, you know, even though I've got bees, which is the most ridiculous thing. But anyway, this is me. I, was, I got stung for the first time this year, and um, it was a wee bit throbby, you know, it lasted for about 20 minutes, got a wee white dot. It was fine, you know. Some people can end up with bad, bad reactions and can be, you know, life threatening, even. So it's, uh, it's one of those things that, you know, might love beekeeping, but over time, these things can cause a lot of havoc with your body. And you have to give it up, you know. But that is very—I would say that was, you know, the majority of people are fine. But so I got stung on this uh, this arm, and I was trying to be really gentle with the bees still, which is really difficult to do when you've got a very, very sore, throbby arm, you know. And um, I didn't let on to the guy who was with me because uh, I didn't want to scare him. I didn't want him to think it's like, oh, I'm not having bees. Uh, so I, that was fine. Saw him off and uh, I went in for a cup of tea and I went back outside the door and I had my suit off and everything at this point and I heard a bee and I closed the door and I thought, oh, look, I can go outside because, you know, they followed me back to the house. And uh, so I you know, counted to 10 and I uh, went back outside and I was listening and no bees, no nothing. And I walked over towards the hive. I was probably about 15 feet away from the hive, really far away. And I was looking over at the hive just to check if they had settled down after, you know, the, the, the experience that they had with me doing the inspection. And a bee went right up my nose and stung me on the tip of my nose. My eyes were watering. I could hardly keep them open. Uh, I had to sniff the bee out of my nose. <laughs> and I was running back into the house thinking it's not going to be the only one because once they sense it, you know, others will come and, you know, attack. <laughs> I ran back into the house and I was like, ah, I started pulling the spigot out of my nose. Oh, it was what a palaver. Um, but that didn't stop me though. I, you know, it's still, um, yeah, they fascinate me too much to let, to let something like that bother me. So, uh, but yes, yeah, it was an experience, definitely. So see see how you, you, you were saying there that you split the, the hive. Um, will you have to put another queen in that box or... Will they be yeah. okay? So yeah. that that is the best way to do it um, when time really isn't on our side up here on the island, you know. So you, we can't hang around and wait and hope for the best that a queen's going to go out and mate, which is, you know, very, very unlikely, really, unless you looked at the forecast and you could see that for the next three weeks, we're going to have perfect weather. Then you'd say there is no problem. And definitely between the three hives that, you know, they would find... Um, uh, the drones, uh, the queen would find the drones to to make them. Um, but yeah, so the safest option is to just go online and buy a queen. Um, and there's no, you know, there's no sort of like legal thing to stop you from buying the queens from anywhere you like. So Becky's Bees is actually down in Norfolk or uh, somewhere in England. You know, there's, there's a few companies like that uh, that will deliver the queens. And, you know, they, they could actually have, you know, diseases in them and stuff. So like you were saying, Jonathan, there's actually, you know, people shouldn't be saying to you that, you know, you shouldn't be taking bees up here because, um, A, we're very wide apart from each other anyway, just if that's not a problem. But, um, but also, you know, there's other ways that these diseases can make their way to the island anyway. You know, people people say these things, but uh, you know what people are like. <laughs> well, you know, you, know, so, you know what social media is like. And nobody's yes, got anything, yes. people haven't got anything to do, so the keyboard warriors... That's really? it, exactly, uh, exactly. So yeah, so it's nothing to, nothing to worry about. Yeah, but yeah, buying, buying queens online um, or finding somebody locally who might have, you know, no, somebody might actually have a queen um, um, is the, the best 
uh, the best option, just to get them up and running as soon as possible to build up enough bee numbers to, for them to be able to make it through the winter on their own. I think, without I, think to... the, I think the idea of having several hives, if I go ahead with this, having several hives on the property um, would increase the chance of uh, a queen going out and mating mm -hmm. and coming back. So yeah. dealing with one hive, like I would at home, um, and there's plenty of bees around, so that's how it uh, how it happens. But I think probably if I did it, I would have to get start off three, two or three hives yeah. with a colony of black bees. I'd go for, like I said, with with a queen in. Um, hopefully, the friend I've got down in Manish decides to keep bees again. But I think is died over the summer. Um, apart from the ones that he had nicked a few years ago. I mean, can't believe that, that somebody took the hives and took the bees. Um, I know it hit the papers anyway, but I do yeah. know there is somebody on Scalpay that keeps bees. Yeah. So yeah. I might start looking people up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, def definitely. It's good to know who's around you. You know, some people can be very private to beekeepers as well, you know, so if you're doing it, you know, if you're wanting to find these people for the good dog, the bees, you know, and whatnot, you know, it's definitely worthwhile seeking these people out and letting them know that you know what what your plan is and stuff you know so uh, yeah de definitely definitely worth it but what you were saying about having more than one uh hive for the uh, the queen to be able to go out and possibly mate the the good the, the good thing about my ones this year having more than uh one hive was that one of the hives made it through the winter but were very very low in numbers and the queen wasn't able to then lay more eggs because the cluster was getting bigger. So she didn't actually have, um, the, it just wasn't warm enough um, and there weren't enough bees. So what I had to do was donate a frame of fruit, an entire, an entire frame full of fruit from my very strong hive and put that in with them. Um, and because there were no bees, hatched bees sitting on the frame, they actually took to that frame of fruit very well. So I ended up with a mixed, breed of bees for about a month um, where I had some nice quite black bees and then I had really orange ones as well and they were they were mixing them mixing perfectly fine they felt like that was there so so that's uh, one good way of um, you know recovering um, a hive without having to just say you know count it as a loss and um, yeah. so that's what I did and now they're, they're actually a, a strong hive and um, I did requeen that hive because I um, I thought you know, it, it, it's very likely that it's it's the, the type of queen and that she, she wasn't playing as well and that they just didn't make it through the winter as well. So I replaced the queen uh, early this season and we'll see what happens this year, this winter. Do you guys have your hives quite, are, are they near one another or are they quite far apart or does that depend on the type of bee or, or, or what? The the bees can be just a foot apart if you wanted um the only problem that you could find is that they, they can be some of them can be robbing bees uh, which is another trait another trait in them so they can actually go into other hives and steal their store uh, so that's not that's not so good um thankfully mine aren't like that but yeah they can just be if you, if you, if you, if you, if you, getting some chemical waste Piles and piles and piles of it together. So they, they, they won't get t t territorial then, is kind of what I'm, what I'm getting at. Right? Uh, yeah, no, not not uh, particularly, no. Obviously, uh, the, the ones uh, that are robbing, then uh, they, they're the ones that are the problem. So yeah. in a way, so they're kind of territorial, but you know, it's <laughs> kind of like in a strange kind of, strange kind of way. And also for them to find their own home, when you've got two hives, well, like it's it's never a problem because <laughs> they have got the most amazing bees. Some people put different colours in their hives uh, to distinguish uh, each one so that they can just find them a lot easier. If the restaurant won't sell you one, yes. Perfect. There's an off, there's an off -light Does anybody else have any any questions? I, I Do you want to know anything else? We should be able to get no all good well um yeah for the pities thank you for joining us and sharing your your passion for for beekeeping um 
otherwise yeah, i've really enjoyed it anyway i was i was trying to think of a really clever pun there but i'm just not going to go at it so um, it was the bee's knees <laughs> it was the bee's knees. <laughs> so anyway guys thanks all for joining us uh i'll end the recording